Hallelujah. When nothing else, nothing else could help. Love. Somebody need to say love. Just touch your neighbor and say love. Love lifted me. Hallelujah. What a mighty God we serve. I'm just happy to be in church today. Are you happy to be in church today? Did God wake you up this morning? Put food on your table. Put clapping in your hands. Some joy bells in your soul. Are you ready to praise the Lord? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm just so thrilled and honored to be here at CWC. Give God praise one more time. I want to thank God for your pastor, my pastor, Pastor Dr. Abraham Jules. Uh, when he called me, I was already booked to be in Washington, D.C., uh, but uh, when he spoke to me, I said, Pastor, whatever you want, you want me to do. And so uh, what I did, I rescheduled. Uh, let me tell you that Pastor Jules is so special to me that whatever he asks me to do, if he asks me to sweep out the church, I just ask, Pastor, where is the broom? Where is the broom, Pastor? It's a wonderful, wonderful, great. I want you to know your pastor is great. Your pastor is a great man of God. It's no exaggeration. I'm not trying to big him up for anybody to go tell him that he knows that I believe that. I believe in Pastor Jules. Hallelujah, because he believes in Jesus. He's an awesome man of God. I'm just happy to be here with Dr. Goff and the other wonderful ministers of the gospel. I just thank God for these graduates. And I notice uh, the culture when we go to graduation these days. Uh, it's all right to make noise. Even if they say don't applaud until the last one comes up, we break the rule. Because you know why? Almost 50% of our black kids are either pushed out, left out, kicked out, or dropped out of high school. But thank God today we can celebrate in this church. Thank God. I want those who are not trying to start trying. Because when we were growing up, we didn't have school bus picking us up, or breakfast or lunch program. The only lunch program we had was when we were passing Mr. Brown's mango tree. Lord forgive us. Uh, and some of us didn't graduate ma magma cum laude. We graduated, thank you, Lord. Eh? Thank you, Lord. Eh? Amen. And so thank God for encouraging these young people here today. We bless the name of the Lord. Let's get to the business at hand. I thank God for Brother Morris, who's my friend. He's been giving me some good boiled dumplings from way back in the days. He was the cook at Andrews, and I was the intern and the chaplain at the hospital. Never forget when people give you good food. But what's most admirable about Elder Morris is that he has a theology, and it doesn't have anything to do with the apotelismatic principle but he believes in praise. He understands that when a preacher stands up, it's not just a monologue. It is not even a dialogue. It's a trialogue. It's the preacher, God, and the worshipers. 
Hallelujah. Thank God. So God has placed Brother Morris here to teach us how to worship. So if you're too cute to clap, too sophisticated to shout, and too educated to get excited, then you need to talk with Brother Morris. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Let's get to the business at hand. The word comes to us today from Exodus chapter 4. Reading verse 2 to verse 5. The word says, And the Lord said unto Moses, What is that in thine hand? And he said, A rod. He said, cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. The Lord said unto Moses, put forth thine hand, and take it by the tail. He put forth his hand and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob had appeared unto me. I'd like you to help me just kickstart this sermon by just turn to your neighbor and just say to your neighbor, it's already in your hand. Already in your hand. Let us pray. Wonderful, loving God, we praise you. We honor you for this church, this pastor, this congregation, these visitors. Lord, for this word, may it come to us quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. May it inspire, motivate, and uplift us. Lord, may we praise you all the days of our lives. Bless us today, for we need the blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's already in your hand. A marvelous, wonderful, marvelous, and matchless grace of God has so fixed it that all of us, all of us came into this world with certain divinely endowed assets which rightly valued, developed, and invested can carry us through the maddening maze of life. Contrary to popular belief, we did not come here empty-handed. We did not come here without the means or the material we needed to make our way through life. Before God pushed us off the ledge of eternity and sent us sliding down the birth canal, we were divinely designed and cosmically created with celestial resources in our hands to move any obstacle, perform any duty, fulfill any mission, assume any responsibility, and successfully perform any task that God has given us. We need to hear this word today because in the give and take of our everyday living, we're constantly bombarded with negative messages that will tell us that there is nothing in our hands and that we'll never amount or reach to anything, or reach anywhere in life. As wonderful a place as this world might be, we bump into such negativity everywhere that unless our souls are anchored in the life-giving spring of eternity, we would not have a dream nor a drive. We would end up on the trash heap of time, and life would pass us by. But my message in capsule form today is 
We're more than skin and bones. We're more than tissues and tendons. We're more than genes and chromosomes. We're larger than our background and greater than our circumstances. For greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. When it's all said and done, there is another dimension to our being that outweighs all the rest. It's called the God factor, the image of God in us, the love of God embracing us, the mercies of God keeping us, and the power of God transforming whatever we've got in our, our hands. The truth is that in our hands, we have limitless potentials, and God's promise is that he will take it, he will transform it, and he will use it for the glory of his kingdom. You see, God's plan is all about where you're going. It's not where you've been. It's about your potential. It's not about your pitfall. God, when God looks at you, he's able to see what others cannot see. God sees your potential. Let me illustrate it this way. The NBA, the NBA signed LeBron James coming straight out of high school. And what you may not remember is that Nike also signed him to a $100 million endorsement contract before he ever played his first NBA game. Because when Nike looked at LeBron, 6'8", 260 pounds, when they saw him playing in high school, they did not only see the high school athlete he was, but they envisioned the NBA superstar he could become. So when Nike gave him the contract, they endorsed his potential. Can I preach this thing up in here? Because I have breaking news for somebody today. Because if Nike could have invested so much in LeBron, how much more God will invest in his children when he sees your potential. See, when God looks at you, he does not see your past. He sees your future. He does not look at your insufficiency. He looks at your sufficiency. You may be bruised, battered, and broken, but God sees you blessed. You may be weak and wounded, but God sees you whole. You may be down and out, but God sees you up and back on your feet again. You may be rejected and dejected, but God sees you elected, accepted, and designated. It's all about your potential. So God makes a promise to you because God knows what's in you that have not yet come out of you. So why don't you turn to the person sitting next to you and just say there is greatness in you that has not yet come out of you. But right now, I'm going to release it, release it, release it, release it in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Well, the word lets us know that Moses had in his hand what was called in the Hebrew economy a rod. It was a shepherd's tool. It was about three to six feet long. Shepherds used the crooked end to pull the wandering sheep back into the herd and the blunted end to chase away enemies from the flock. For the shepherd, the rod was like American Express card. You don't leave home without it. 
It was indispensable, essential, critical, crucial to the everyday livelihood and life of the shepherd. When God found Moses, he was on the backside of the mountain tending sheep. God found him standing before an ever-burning, yet never-burned cluster of book. God said, Moses, take off your shoes from off your feet, for the ground that you're standing is holy ground. Let me just park in this curb to remind you that when we come into the presence of God, we are on holy ground, and we must come with fear and awe and reverence before the divine creator, before the divine sovereign God, who descends from his throne, from his, his eternal throne, and meets us majestically in a moment of rapture and intimacy. That's why David says, in his presence is fullness of joy, and at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. Hallelujah. So God said, come here, Moses. Come here, Moses. I want you to become the legendary leader and liberator to bring the fledgling slaves out of Egyptian bondage. I want you to go down and tell old Pharaoh, let my people go. But Moses was afraid. He was intimidated and trepidated and would not capitulate to God's invitation. Moses said, who am I? Who am I to go up against the mighty King Pharaoh to bring the Israelites out of bondage? Moses said, who shall I tell them sent me? God said, tell them that I am that I am. And notice that, if you will, that God spoke in the singular. For God was not to be compared with wrath our Oros, our Osiris, are the other gods of Egypt, for he alone is God, and he alone must be exalted. He's not to be made better, for no other god exists. He is not to be compared in the comparative, neither in the superlative, for there's none with superlative attributes. For he is not the best God. He is the only God. In fact, he is the first cause, the only cause, the cause behind all cause, and the cause without a cause. Because from everlasting to everlasting, he is God. Tell them, I am that I am. Moses said, King Pharaoh won't listen. The people won't even believe anything that I say. Moreover, all my life, I've been a failure and a fugitive, a, fugitive, a convicted murderer and a cold-blooded monster. And don't forget that I'm a lost Hebrew boy taken out of the bulrushes of the River Nile, put up for adoption, grew up in a foster home in Egypt. I've been a traitor a conspir conspirator, a defector. Moreover, I cannot speak. I don't have eloquence nor grandiloquence. If I go down to Pharaoh, I'll be arrested, persecuted, and executed. Moses summed it all up in one verse saying, Lord, please send somebody else, but please don't send me. But God saw what Moses could not see. God saw his potential. And God had a job for Moses. One anonymous poet said, when God wants to drill a man and thrill a man and skill a man, when God wants to mold a man to play the noblest part, when he yearns with all his heart to create so great and bold the man that all the world shall praise. Watch his method, watch his ways, how he ruthlessly perfects whom he royally elects, 
how he hammers him and hurts him with mighty blows, converts him. That's what God does with a man. So if you're going through a little something right now, that's all right. Maybe God is just trying to get your attention. So God said to Moses, what is that in your hand? Notice how God posed the question. He didn't ask, is there anything in your hand? He asked, what is that in your hand? May I teach this while I preach it? Because the word that is an Old Testament word, a new to demonstrative pronoun. It is a definite article used to identify a specific person or a thing. So implicit in the question is the understanding that there is something in Moses' hand. See, don't trust it when God asks you a question. If God ever asks you a question, it's a setup. Because he is God and he knows everything. God asks Adam, where art thou? He asks Cain, where is your brother? He asks Joseph, Jacob, what is your name? He asks Ezekiel in a valley full of dry bone, can these bones live? But thank God, Ezekiel knew better than to look like he graduated from Harvard. He said, Lord, thou knowest. You know, Lord. You see, God is from everlasting to everlasting, and God knows everything. So when God asks the question, it's not to get information, it is to get your attention. Because nothing is hidden from God. He is never surprised. He's never taken off guard. Never in a country. He's never, he's, he's never needed to be informed of anything, instructed in anything, or reminded of anything, because he is God. And God sees what's in your hand even before you know that there is something in your hand. God knew that he had already placed something in Moses' hand. So Moses said, I have a rod, Lord. There was nothing special about a rod. It was just a dry piece of stick. But what was significant about it is that it was what Moses had. God did not ask Moses about what he did not have. His question was all about what he had. He didn't ask Moses to go find somebody with something in their hand. He didn't ask Moses to go and get something and put it in your hand. No, he asked, what is that in your hand? See, we could make a long list of what we don't have. Some of us don't have enough money. Hello, somebody. Some of us don't have a good education. Some of us don't have houses and land and cars. Some of us don't have high social standing. Some of us don't have any political connection. And the list goes on and on. But God never asked for, for what we don't have, but about what you do have, even if it is small, insin insignificant, Small and insignificant. So if you can't sing like Whitney Houston, use what you got and bless the name of the Lord. If you don't have money like Bill Gates, just use what you got. If you're not funny like Steve Harvey, use what you got. Give God praise. If you can't act like Denzel Washington, just use what you got. If you can't teach like Mary Bethune, use what you got. If you can't write music like Mozart, just use what God gave you. 
If you can't write the ninth symphony like Beethoven, use what God gave you. If you're not as beautiful as Beyonce, that's all right. Use what you got because you were created in the image and the likeness of Almighty God. I may not be able to preach like T.D. Jakes, but I'm going to use what I got to lift up the mighty name of Jesus. Because he said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Just use what you got. Use what you got. So if you can't preach, teach. If you can't teach, pray. If you can't pray, testify. If you can't testify, sing. If you can't sing, talk. If you can't talk, run. If you can't run, walk. If you can't walk, stand. If you can't stand, sit. If you can't sit, lean. If you can't lean, look. If you can't look, think. If you can't think, feel. If you can't feel, wait. For they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Use what you got. Just use what God gave you. Use it to bless his name. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his court with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. I said the Lord is good. And his mercies endure it forever. Bless the name of Jesus. Moses said, Lord, I have a rod in my hand. It was a symbol of where he was and where he had been. The rod was a reminder that he was a wilderness fugitive and that he didn't have white collar connection and was not working with corporate Egypt. A rod to remind him that he was living on the bare edges of existence and surviving on the naked margins of society. A rod which was hewn out of hard wood, curved and designed to do the shepherd work. Just a simple rod, but what Moses did not know was that whatever was in his hand, God could take it, God could transform it by his mighty power that God could change it from natural to supernatural, from ordinary to extraordinary, from insignificant to significant, for little becomes much. I say little becomes much when we place it in the master's hand. So God said to Moses, I can imagine Moses standing up there just shocked and uh, he doesn't know what to do. God said to Moses, cast it to the ground. Cast the rod to the ground. I want to give you a preview of coming attraction. You all don't go to the movies. Eh? That's all right. I want to give you a preview of my plans, purpose, and providential possibilities for your life. And my brothers and sisters, I came by to tell you that you will never be all that you were meant to be until you give whatever is in your hand to God. Yeah. When Moses cast the rod to the ground without any spell, without any enchantment, without any voodoo or any obia, the rod turned into a serpent. Help me, Holy Ghost. And I can imagine the rod on the ground and Moses started stepping backward and stepping, stepping back and keeping his eyes on, on the snake. And then the Bible says he turned 
and he ran away. The bro I, I, I'm be human. If I were there, I'd probably start running also. I, I know some of you all are brave, filled with the Holy Ghost, blessed and highly favored. Hello, God bless you. But I'm going to run from that snake. All his years, Moses waited for a miracle from the Lord, for a life-changing experience. And when it came, he just started running away. May I just pause here just to let you know that God wants to take your limited abilities and your limited resources and use them for his greater good. And only when you release them, when you release them, when you release them before the Lord, that his divine supernatural authority will come over your life. And I want to submit to you that Moses is an example or a paradigm for every one of us who walked through those doors and came into this church today. God has placed something in your hand. Not only in your hands, but also in your heart. Tell somebody you got something. You got something. I don't know what you got, but God knows. And in the process of time, God will show you what you have in your hands. And God will take it. God will change it. God will transform it. God will bless it. God will improve on it. God will reorder and reorganize it. Somebody up in here, you've been in the wilderness for a mighty long time. You've been asking God for a miracle. You've been walking around with a rod that needs energizing, that needs spiritual invigoration. Somebody came to church today walking with your rod. You don't know what to do with it, but I'm here to let you know that if you just cast it before the Lord, if you just present to the Lord, I don't care what it is. Maybe it's your money. Maybe it's your gift. If maybe it's your talent. God wants to turn it around. God wants to change it. Release it on holy ground. And look beyond your apparent limitation of ability and resources. And look to the source of all power and all possibility. So God changed the rod into a serpent. And I, if I were there, I would ask, God, God, why did you change it into a serpent? Why not a bird or a cat or a little poodle or, or, or a rabbit jumping out of a hat? A hat? Why a serpent? Why a dangerous, venomous reptile which is symbolic of everything that is evil. Why, Lord? And it dawned on me as I read further in the text that God wanted Moses to know that the assignment to which he was called was going to be a dangerous, hazardous, and treacherous assignment. Watch this, watch this, watch this. The Egyptian king and pharaohs, they wore a crown on their head that had a form or shape of a metal cobra snake at the top of the helmet. Hello, somebody. It was a symbol of their power, of their strength, of their royalty, of their authority in the ancient Egyptian empire. Therefore, God converted the rod into a snake. And the conversion of the rod was not merely a portent. It was a sign to Moses that victory would be assured over the kings 
and over the pharaohs in Egypt. God was saying, I will give you power. I will give you authority over the kingdom of Egypt. God was saying, if you just willing to trust me and rely upon me and put your confidence in me, I will give you authority to tread on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. God was saying no weapon that's formed against you, Moses, shall prosper because on their head are some metal snakes, but I'm showing you live snake that when you begin to work, hallelujah, I will be with you to give you power. So while the serpent was moving around the ground, moving around, slithering around on the ground, because God said, come back, Moses, come back, come back. Where, where are you running to? You see, we, we can't be running from our miracles forever. Hello, somebody. You can't be running from your snake. God said, come back, Moses. And God said to Moses, take it by the tail. Help me, Jesus. Now, that's scary. Now, sometimes I don't understand God because that's real scary right there. Because everybody who study snakes, the hepatologists, they say you, don't, you never pick up a snake by the tail. No, no, no. They say pick up the snake by the head, at the back of the head. You pick up the serpent and then you use your body to hold the serpent and hold the head of the serpent so that the tail, the tail is okay, but the head cannot turn to bite you. Hello, somebody. I'm getting ready to preach up in here. Because you see, God is saying to Moses, Moses, pick up your snake by the tail, but let me deal with the head. Hello, somebody. The head is dangerous. The head will bite you. The head is venomous. So you keep messing with the tail and let me deal with the head. You can manage the head. Let me tell you, my brothers and sisters, that some of us were trying to pick up our snakes by the head. When you try to pick up your snake by the head, you are leaving God out of the picture. You're leaving God. And some of us, we got some snakes to deal with. Hello, somebody. Snakes on the jaw. Woo, help me, Holy Ghost. Uh, snakes, snakes, snakes in your family. Uh, some, even you got even some church snakes. Woo! I, I think I'm going to change this sermon. I'm going to change. You got some snakes in church ready to bite you. Some pythons and vipers and cobra and mamba and all kind of snakes in church. But hallelujah, God says, you deal with the tail. You see, the God we serve is always the God who is dealing with the most serious part of our problems. When we down here crying, oh Lord, you want me to hold the snake by the tail. God is saying, shut up. I'm dealing with the head. You can't deal with the head. You just deal with what I told you to deal with. And today, my brothers and sisters, in the name of Jesus, we need to serve notice on the devil that by the power of the divine God, we're going to pick up our serpents. We're going to pick them up by the tail. Hallelujah. And trust God to deal with the head and demonstrate authority over every spirit of darkness. Hallelujah. 
And one more thing, one more thing. God will deal with your most serious part of your problem. Stop crying. Stop having a pity party. Wake up and give God thanks for blessing you with one more day. Just say, Lord, I'm leaving it in your hands. Whatever you say, Lord, wherever you send me, I'll go. I'm leaving it to you. You deal with it. Hallelujah. So my brothers and sisters, today God is saying, pick up your serpent. Pick up your difficulties. Pick up your challenges. Pick up your problems. Pick up your, your, your sickness. Pick up your financial problem. Pick up your husband and wife problem. Pick it up by the tail. You deal with the small part. And the small part just get down on your knees and say, Lord, I'm leaving it in your hands. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I had a problem the other day. I had a problem. I can't tell you because I know church people, they love your business. So I just give you the edited version. But I had a problem that I was supposed, I was trying to deal with for one whole week. And I, the deadline was Sunday before sunset. And I was going everywhere, running everywhere, talking to everybody, Lord, how am I going to work out this? But I didn't pray to God until about Sunday, 3 o'clock. I said, Lord, I'm not asking you for your help. I'm asking you to deal with it. Yeah. Some of us, we like to help God when God don't need any help. I said, Lord, please deal with it. And by 6 o'clock, the problem was solved. Yeah. Hallelujah. So I come to church with my testimony today that God is a good God. If you just trust him. If you just rely on him, God is going to work it out. Moses, what is in your hand? Is there a Moses in church today? Is a, there a Moses that God wants to use you? That God wants to turn you around? That God wants to work a miracle in your life? What is that? In your hand, what's your potential? What's your possibility? What is in your possession? What is that in your hand? If you will give it to God, God will make it come alive. Will make it come alive. He will do things in your life that you will never imagine. God will re-energize your rustic rod of incompetence and inconsistency and inactivity. And he will turn it into a miracle. Yeah. Hallelujah. You got to trust God. You got to believe in God. You got to realize that God's got his eyes on you. That you are special in the sight of God. You got to realize that you have value. God values you. And so because you got value, you can't be like everybody else. You got to stand out like Moses. I realize every time I go to the bank, I'm very inquisitive. I look over to see what the teller is doing. And I notice that what the teller does, they have different little drawers, and they have $1 in $1 drawer, $5 in $5 drawer, 10 in 10, 20 in 20, and then you got the $100 drawer. Hello, somebody. You will never see a $100 bill in a $10 or a $1 drawer. Because the reason the teller separates them 
is because she wants to identify them very easily. So when she goes for a hundred dollars, she knows where the hundred dollars are. Can I preach this thing up in here? Because God has separated you. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. You're a peculiar people. And because you got value. You can't be with any and everybody. Hallelujah. And so there was nothing mystical or magical about the rock. But once Moses surrendered it, it became a powerful symbol of deliverance, freedom, and liberation. Moses used the rock to get the children of Israel out of Egypt. With the rod, Moses struck the Nile and it turned into blood. With the rod, he brought frogs out of the waters of Egypt. With the rod, he brought a plague of locusts. With the rod, he brought down fire, thunder, and hail from heaven. With his rod, he divided the Red Sea and erected walls on either side. With the rod, he struck the rock and water gushed forth. And when he held the rod high in the air, he prevailed in battle over the enemies. What is in your hand today? God wants to use it. I believe that God is talking to somebody. Somebody who is worshiping in this room right now. He's talking to a young man or a young woman. You feel that you can't make it. He's talking to a high school student who is wondering, what next am I going to be able to fulfill my purpose in this life? He's talking to somebody from a broken home, poor neighborhood, rough background. God is talking to you. You will never be ready to live out your full dream and your true potential until you place all that you got in the hands of God. The word today is use what you got. Turn to your neighbor, tell your neighbor, use what you got. Use what you got. All Jacobin had in her hand was some straws. But she wove it into a basket to shelter Moses as he cruised along the bull rushes of the river Nile. All Miriam had in her hand was a timbrel, but she used it to sing songs of praise and led the children of Israel across the Red Sea. All that Honor had in her hand was a small child, but when she gave them to God, he became one of the greatest prophets in Israel. All Ruth had was a stock of grain, but God used it to sustain her family and led her by God's providence to be included in the lineage of Jesus. All a little boy had was two fish and five loaves, but Jesus used it to feed 5,000 people. All Mary of Bethany had was a box, a jar of precious alabaster, but hallelujah, she gave it to Jesus. All a widow had was two copper coins, known as the widow's might, but God honored it, and when she gave it to God, God blessed her life. I'm here to let somebody know today that whatever you have, whatever God blessed you with, whatever you possess, give it to God. Give it to God. Help me, Mr. Musician. Give it to God. Release it. Whatever you have, God will touch it. God will change it. God will take it. God will use it. God will fix it. God will correct it. God will convert it. God will anoint it. God will inspire it. God will bless it. Trust God. Accept God. Believe God. Obey God. 
Praise God. He will change it. He will change it. If there's pain in your body, he'll change it. If your husband acting crazy, he can change it. If you're broke, busted, and disgusted, God can change it. If your children acting funny, he can change it. If death stares you in the face, God, I say God, God, God will bless it. God will give you life. Somebody came here today. You feel down. You feel depressed. You feel like you can't make it. But God sent me here to tell you that weeping only endure for a night. But joy, joy, joy. I said joy. Joy comes in the morning. God is good. Be not dismayed. Whatever be tied, God will take care of you beneath his wings of love abide. God will. I say God will. Touch your neighbor, tell your neighbor, God will take care of you. Do I have 10 people in the house who believe that God is with you? That God can change your situation? That God can empower you? And you just want to stand and wave your hand? Wave it in the ear like you just don't care? Because God is good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What a mighty God! What a mighty God! What a mighty God!